Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Koinonia Hour. And it's great to have Howard Elseth back. Welcome back, Howard. Thank you, Joni. Um, I got a new hat today. <laughs> it says, relax. God is in control. Perfect. And there's a scripture there, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding with all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world today we've got to realize that god is always in charge and uh wow now last week and a couple of weeks before we were talking about the red heifer and there's probably a few things we should wrap up we talked a lot about this fellow that was 38 years by the pool. Well, he wasn't 38 years necessarily by the pool of Bethesda, but he had an infirmity for 38 years. And Jesus knew that he had been a long while at the pool. And he said, would you be made whole? He said, yeah. And he said, my problem is that when the water's troubled, the first one into the pool, gets healed, and someone always seems to beat me there. So Jesus healed him, So take up your bed and walk. And of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees got mad at him because Jesus had a way of doing these things on the Sabbath. And he says to the man, go and sin no more, that something worse doesn't happen to you. He told the woman taking adultery, go and sin no more. And so we talked about the no sin doctrine last week. And I think some people can kind of get confused and, and understanding, well, are we to live without sin? Well, that's what the Bible is suggesting that you uh, cannot sin in John. After you're born of God, we talked about being born again as a little child, and then you're, you're growing up, and so you, you, you slip and fall, and you, you fill your diaper, all these types of things. And so you have to come to a point of maturity. And he told Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. So there's some interesting developments here. And so... How do you live out this concept of no sin? And how do you deal this without uh, pride and different things entering in? And God was showing me in Philippians chapter 3, and I want to uh, use this to wrap up how Paul looked at living without sin and how he addressed this subject. So he talks about in Philippians chapter three, and he's and, and we'll start with scripture seven. But what things were gained to me, those that I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom. I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He's really laying down here, if you want to be in the kingdom of God and want to be a partner with Christ, you're going to have to count all things, not some, but all things but dung and loss for the sake of Christ. So he's laying this very strong. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. A lot of people that say, well, I'm a good person, and, if, and they're going to make themselves righteous by the law. But Paul is sharing, that doesn't work. But that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable 
unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, this gets really interesting here in Scripture 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, that sounds like a tongue twister, but he's laying the foundation. Now, look what he says next. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing, do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So if anybody asks you, say, well, do you still sin? This is the passage you should quote to him. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them that walk so as ye have us for an example, not example, but in sample. You're in this walk. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weepingly that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, whose mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Who, changed, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Wow, subdues all things. Now, I want to go quickly to Deuteronomy 28. I was studying in that this morning. We're still kind of in preliminary here. But we're going to be talking about what is thy mother? And who is thy mother? But I, I want to cover a couple of little preliminary things. Deuteronomy 28, 58. And, and Deuteronomy 28 is all about the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. And everybody should read this chapter two or three times because it makes everything really simple. If you're subjective to God and obedient to him, there will be blessings upon blessings. If you're disobedient to God, there will be curses and curses. And I, I, I noticed here in Scripture 58, he says, if thou will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear the glorious and fearful name of thy God. Now, the phrase in this book Comes out to 1611. In is eight, this is 11, and book is eight. Remember that numerical value for book, because when we start talking about the mother, we're going to see a close relationship. 
But the word this starts with a tau. We call it a T. It's also the cross. It's also a factotum. By factotum, I mean the first word or letter in words is generally called a factotum. And part of the interesting rules of ancient English is you can drop the factotum. And so it would read in his book, in his law, a very possessive thing. Now, another thing that we need to look at is scripture 67. In the morning thou shalt say, would to God it were evening, at evening thou shalt say, would to God it were morning. And it tells you why. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thy eyes which thou shalt see. This is really important to understand that the fear of God is the fear of God is in the heart. Understand that the fear of God is in the heart. So we look at John chapter 16. Um, I think your camera's off right now. Do you want to maybe someone might be trying to call you or are you there? Uh, there I am again. Yeah, I, I there you go. Okay, okay. I just want everybody to see you. Oh, it went off again. <laughs> Did it go off again? Yeah. It's on now. I can see you. Okay, we'll keep going then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in John 16, 6, the last word in Scripture 6 is heart. And if you cross the river, which is that center line there, the two lines, the river of life, because either side of the river, it says is the tree of life. And so the text is the tree of life. It says, remember the word that I said, heart. Every time you see the word heart, remember what God says, remember the word that I said, because the fear of God is in the heart. You believe with the heart. Everything is around, centered around the heart, which is sometimes even called the soul. So this is important to uh, see see these things. Now, John 3.16, where most of us are familiar with that, and that is telling you, for God so loved the world. But so many people confuse for God so loved the world with for God so loved the church. The love that he has for the church it's totally uniquely different than the love that he has for the world. Yes, he died on the cross, and his desire is that all would be saved. But when we're dealing with the church, it's a whole different level of love. And we're and this is going to be, come out in when we start understanding what is thy mother. And so uh, we we often hear this phrase and. and a lot of uh, people that are teaching married counseling will say, "Well, husbands love your wife even as Christ so loved the church, loved the church and gave himself for it." And they will put a period after that, but there's no period there. And and you got to understand the context. Ephesians is a very marvelous book because it'll have uh, four or five scriptures in a row before you get a period. And oftentimes we try to put a period after every scripture and, and you, you, you mess up what God is saying here. So when we look at uh, this portion here of how Christ is gonna love the church, there are conditions here. And, and so it goes on, husbands love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might 
sanctify. Now, what is that? That's a big word. That he might sanctify means to set apart something special. The church is something special that he might sanctify. Then there's a big ampersand there. He doesn't just want to sanctify or set you apart. He wants you to be cleansed. Remember the red heifer? The red heifer was all about being without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. And what he's saying here is that he's trying to make the church his red heifer. Because he goes on to say that he might sanctify and cleanse it, talking about the church, with the washing of water by the word. So his, his way of loving the church is cleansing it, sanctifying it, washing it with the water by the word. And he's telling the husband, you have a mini church in your wife and you're to sanctify that wife. When you take on a wife, she's separated from all other people. She becomes special. And he says, you need to sanctify, set her, her apart, ampersand, big billboard, cleanse her or it with the washing of water by the word. That he, double E, we're getting to the spiritual, because he says we're talking about the church here, might present to him a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. And he goes on, so men ought to love their wives, their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished, cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, that the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular particular, so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, we got to back up the big boat or the ship or the train or whatever you have. You'll notice that when God deals with the man, he first deals with with the woman. And, and he's dealing here with the church and he's saying, why do I, what are the conditions that I will bring blessings and not curses upon the church when I bring in curses on the world? What is the difference how I love the church than I love the world? And what's the difference between these two entities, between the church and the world? The church, this is key, has repented and is in submission to God, to Jesus Christ. Without repentance and submission, the church does not get the benefits of eternal life and the outpouring of the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. So this also goes for the wife. This is why uh, we see earlier, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, a lot of people take this out of context saying, well, the, the husband is to submit to the wife. This is not addressing that issue. This is addressing the issue of members of the church submitting one to another, the men in the church submitting one to another, because he qualifies this in the very next scripture. He says, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. So he 
you cannot expect me as being a member of a church to expect uh, Joe or Bill's wife to submit to me the way my wife should submit to me. You, you can see that clearly it would be inappropriate. That's called adultery, fornication. There's a lot of different levels that that can come from. So he quickly qualifies the Apostle Paul, said, wives submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the word be there has a double E, which we're talking about spiritual things, that the wife is subject in everything. In other words, in order to qualify for the love of Christ to the church, you have to be in submission. Children, obey your parents. He even tells people that are working for a boss, even if the boss is not, uh, he's forward and not really uh, a wonderful person, he said, Peter says, submit to him. Submission is the key for men to Christ, for wives, to their husband, for children, to their parents. The key to understanding how Christ loves the church is complete learning how to walk in submission. So we're going to start understanding this a little bit more as we talk about what is thy mother, who is thy mother. Now we go over to John chapter 16. And scripture 7. And the Bible says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. We see over in 1426, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, ampersand, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So this Comforter is the Holy Ghost, and he's going to come on this earth and he's going to kind of run the whole church program. Now, the church has pretty much dismissed the comforter, and they've replaced him with the Holy Spirit, which is a wonderful being that God used to seal us. He used him as a witness, and the Holy Spirit acts almost like a wife in complete submission to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost bear record in heaven, and they are one. So it's 1 John 5, 7. It's important to see this. Now, here's what the Holy Ghost does. And when he, the Holy Ghost, is come, he will reprove the world of sin. The outer court says he will convince the world of sin. We have to see this big picture or, or we're going to get confused what's going on here. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. The key to getting into God's kingdom is not works, 
but it's faith or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is important. Not a word so that any man should boast. All our righteousness is a filthy rag. What he's trying to do is simply get us to believe on him so he can dispense his mercy. He even told Jezebel, who was destroying the church, he said, I gave her a space to repent, but she repented not. Now it says of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Notice he didn't say I reprove the world of unrighteousness because he just did that when he said I reprove the world or convince the world of sin. Now he's convincing those who have ears to hear of righteousness, that righteousness is the only way to walk and to live. If you want the benefits of Deuteronomy 28, you have to walk in the righteousness of Christ that is a free gift that he gives you. And you plant that righteousness and you give back the fruit of holiness. You find that in Romans chapter six at the end. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. He judged Satan to be wrong and to be evil and to be wicked. And so you don't want to follow the prince and power of the air. You want to follow the son, Jesus Christ. Wow. So this, this kind of is a little background to understand uh, the conclusion of the red heifer and summing it up. The church is God's spiritual red heifer because it's without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. The wife is to be the husband's red heifer. To, to, and and he, he is supposed to teach his wife and train his wife and to cleanse her with the word. We're all cleansed with the word. What a powerful, powerful thing. So now let's get going and we, we see uh, what is thy mother? That's what Ezekiel asked. And Jesus asked, who is thy mother? I don't think we'll get to the who is thy mother uh, today because there's so much in this concept here. We look at Ezekiel chapter 19. Hey, um, I still can't see you on this side. Do you think you can try to turn your camera on and then back off and then back on again? Let's see if that will bring you back up. Uh, I'm not. I see you. I'm, I'm oh, also. then I, yeah. So I don't know what's going on. I guess I'll just let it just keep running all the way to the end then. <laughs> so you don't see me on your no. Do you want to shut it off and start again? Or? No, no, no. Just keep going because you're in a, on a flow right now and it's fine. People don't, I mean, it'll probably be fine, but um, I don't want you to lose the moment that you're in. So you're at the Ezekiel. Ezekiel 19. Okay. What is your mother? Yeah. And in the headline on Ezekiel 19 are two lions. Now, in the 1833, it separates the word two lions. In the 1611, it has it all as one word. And if you wonder, well, well, what are the two lions? We know Jesus was the Lion of Judah. But in the uh, 1611 Bible, and if you're looking at the page where all the books of the Bible are listed on the left side of the page. On the right side of the page, you will see a picture of, uh, there's a unicorn on the right, there's a lion on the left, and there's a lion on the top. I'm not sure 100% if this is the two lions, but it may be the two lions. The two lions also may be Joseph and Daniel. 
Daniel, we know, went into the lion's den. But as we read this section here on what is thy mother, uh, we, we, I think, will sense that this is talking about Joseph and, 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 and Daniel. Now, moreover, take up a lamentation for the princesses of Israel and say, what is thy mother? And he calls it a lioness. And he lay and she lay down among the lions. She nourished her whelps among her young lions. And she brought up one of her whelps and it became a young lion, ampersand, and learned to catch the prey and devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was taken in their pit and they brought him with chains onto the land of Egypt, which to me that sounds like Joseph. Now, when she saw that she had waited and her hope was lost, then she took another of her whelps and made him a young lion. Daniel was a young lion. And he went up and down among the lions and he became a young lion and learned to catch prey and devoured men. And he knew their desolate places and he laid waste their cities and the land was desolate and the fullness thereof and the noise of his roaring. And the nation set against him on every side from the provinces and spread their net over him and he was taken in their pit and they put him in a ward in chains and brought him to the king of Babylon, which Daniel was brought to the king of Babylon. And they brought him into holes that his voice should no more be heard upon the mountains of Israel. Now, scripture 10, starts changing the narrative and we see something really interesting. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood. Notice it didn't say thy mother is a vine. It said like a vine. Just like it says in uh, 1 Peter, I think it's 5, 18 or somewhere there, that Satan or the devil comes as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Notice it says, as a roaring lion. The word as and the word alike are disqualifiers. They are not. He was not a lion. He was as a lion. She was not a vine, but she was like a vine. So keep that in mind. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood. Then say in your blood, in thy blood. So it's, it's kind of a double picture here. Thy often is a spiritual concept. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. And she had strong rods for the scepters of them that bear rule. And her stature was exalted among the thick branches, ampersand. She appeared in her height with a multitude of her branches, but she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground and the east wind dried up her fruit and her strong rods were broken and withered and fire consumed them. Now this, if you look up in the introduction, this is talking about Jerusalem under the parable of a wasted vine. Because later it talks about in Galatians that we're born again from the mother that is above. 
and now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty ground, and fire is gone out of a rod of her branches, which has devoured her fruit, so that she has no strong rod to be a scepter to rule. This is a lamentation and shall be for a lamentation. Wow. So, this whole thing here is addressing what is thy mother? So we have to take the word mother and look at it. And the simplest way to look at it is to turn it into a number. And if you have my code book, you can turn that in. The word mother comes out to the numerical value of eight. The word book has a numerical value of eight. We know that wisdom, wisdom has builded her seven pillars. Wisdom is always an understanding is always based as a mother. The Bible is a book which is full of wisdom, which is full of understanding. And so it's natural that the Bible would have the same numerical value as the word mother. You see the, the correlation. So mm -hmm. this book becomes, in a sense, a mother to us. So we ask the question, what is your mother? What is your mother? Well, he said, your mother is like a vine in thy blood. Now, you take the Apocrypha. It's like a vine in the Old Testament, it, it, between the two Testaments. It, it's like the blood. Now, we go over to John 15. Now we see here the consolation and mutual love between Christ and his members. He's telling you how he loves the church under the parable of the vine. Now the word vine comes out in Numbers to 1611. The vine in the blood, because life is in the blood, the word blood comes out to 1833. These are two inseparable things that take place here. A comfort in the hatred and persecution of the world, the office of the Holy Ghost and the apostles. This is all in the introduction to chapter 15 of John. So we notice that this is how Christ is going to love the church, and he builds this all around the parable of the vine. And he talks about comfort. And that's the role of the Holy Ghost. It's not to condemn us, but to comfort us. He's mm -hmm. called the comforter. And we kind of overlooked that in today's Christian world. But he was sent here to be the comforter, not to reprove the world, well, to reprove the world of sin, but to convince us of uh, to convince us of uh, I had, of righteousness, not unrighteousness, to convince us that the way to live is to live with righteousness. Now, notice how the first scripture in John fifteen says. And this is Jesus speaking, I am the true vine. I am 
the true 1611. Vine comes after 1611. And my father is ye husbandman. So Jesus is saying, I'm the vine. But Ezekiel is saying the mother is like the vine. So you see that correlation? Yeah. Okay. And every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges that may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word. It's the word that cleans us. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. What he's telling you, there's no other way to get saved. There's no other way to bear fruit. If you want to bear fruit, you got to abide in the vine which in Numbers is 1611. It's a very powerful statement because the word of God, now uh, people may not all around the world understand the 1611 part of it, but they understand that we have to live by the word of God and the phrase, the word of God comes out to 1611. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. None of us can do anything without him. And what, what he's saying, just what he said over in Ephesians 5, that the only way I'm going to get the full love of God is through your full submission to Jesus Christ, to repent of your sins, to turn away from your wicked ways, and to embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's no halfway dealing in this. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He don't want you. And that's not a really a good position to be in, to be spit out of the mouth of God. So uh, this is serious stuff. If if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you're either all in or or you're all out. Mm. Pretty simple. And he's looking for people that are all in and say, I want him and I'm going to submit to him no matter what it takes. This would transform every marriage in the world and every church in the world. If we came to the point where we say, hey, no matter what, I'm all in with Christ. I'm going to submit to him. And if I'm doing something wrong and I figure it out, I'm going to repent and I'm going to follow him just like the apostle Paul did. Well, read Philippians 3 over and over again. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So you got a choice whether you want to be burned up or what, whether you want to be attached to the vine where you're producing fruit. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. Wow, now he's getting into the promise section. If you abide in me and my words, my 1611 Holy Bible, the Word of God, abides in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Wow, this is really 
important stuff. Mm -hmm. Now you see he's taking you all the way back to the Ten Commandments, not as a salvation issue, but a platform of how the kingdom of God is run. Too many people think, well, we're done with the Old Testament. The, the law is holy and righteous. It's not, you're not saved by keeping the law, but you grow and you learn how the kingdom of God operates. You can't have a lawless kingdom and things work. You can't be out committing adultery and be in a good relationship with God. He's very clear about that in Romans chapter one. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we have to be clear. These things have I spoken to you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that to lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. Look at this qualifier. I have it circled in my Bible. If, if you do what I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he might give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. You have to understand the difference between John 3.16 and Ephesians, loving the church, is different than how he loved the world. Keep that really separate in, in your thinking here, because he gives eternal life and all these benefits to the church, which he doesn't give to the world for one reason, because the world is not believing him or in submission to him. It's all about learning how to submit, even if it's uncomfortable. Even, it, Peter says, if your husband is wayward, you submit to him and that through your submission and your holy conversation, he mm -hmm. may be changed and converted. And this is the rule for everybody, whether you're male or female, it all is about submission. Mm -hmm. And that's how the church works. That's how the kingdom of God works. And if you fight things, well, this guy is unjust or he's doing something that's wrong. I'm not going to submit to him. Now, there are conditions where uh, if your husband said, go kill someone or, or violate the Ten Commandments, you have a right to say no, but you still are in submission to him. Uh, th this is a, a powerful thing, and this is where suffering comes in, because the world often puts things on us, and God says, submit to it and learn how to suffer in it, because through it, I can redeem and change people. I think of Jacob DeShazer, who uh, he, he went to the same college I did. I didn't ever known because he was there before me, but he was one of the Doolittle Flyers, and he got put into a concentration camp in Japan, treated horribly and miserably, but he got wonderfully saved and began to submit to his captor. And before it was all over, the fellow who led the uh, terrible events at Pearl Harbor Yamashita or whatever his name was, I can't remember the exact name of the flyer, but he and Jacob de Caesar eventually became friends and both became saved men and preachers of the gospel. Wow. All through submission. 
you think that here's a guy leading the raid on Hawaii and all of the people and the carnage and people that died, and Jacob DeShazer becomes friends and submits to him, and they both become, they both end up being saved. Wow. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than the Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So as a Christian, you got to be ready, one, to stand up unashamed. He that is ashamed of me and my words, I'll be ashamed of you. But if you're not ashamed of his words, and you submit to his words, and you boldly proclaim. If there's someone out there that's trying to uh, proclaim uh, illicit sex or wrong actions, sodomy, whatever, that um, a man married a man is okay, your job is to stand up and say, no, God's word condemns that. And if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you can't participate in that kind of activity. And for that standing, or again, standing against abortion, standing against murder, standing against anything that God is against, you're going to be persecuted. But the Bible says to take it joyfully. Even the spoiling of your goods, take it joyfully. Because this life is just a temporary life on this earth. We're talking about wanting to spend eternity in the kingdom of God and in heaven. So every time you get a chance, get into this book and study it and learn how God thinks. Remember the word that I said unto you. What? A servant is not great in the Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So he says, you're going to endure persecution if you stand up because the world's going to hate you. All these things they will do unto you for my name's sake because they knew not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now that they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. And if I have not done among the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now they have both seen ampersand, hated both me ampersand and my father. Notice the importance of the ampersand. They're like a billboard. Pay attention. They hated me. They hated my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Look at 26. But when the comforter is come, which is the Holy Ghost, whom I will send unto you, from the Father, and he comes even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. He's saying, you will be my witness as the Spirit of truth, or the Holy Spirit, testifies of me. And they're all testifying, we're all testifying of the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who's going to give you comfort in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of suffering. Wow. Mm. What is thy mother? Also, we're going to ask the question, who is thy mother? Well, this is a 43-page booklet. As we said, Ezekiel posed the question, what is thy mother? Jesus poses the question, who is thy mother? 
Both questions are intriguing and virtually essential to understanding the Bible. In fact, Jesus hinted that unless you understand these parables, and he talks about the parable of the sower, and, and these questions, how can you understand anything that is written in the Bible? If you cannot understand these questions, you'll never be able to understand the depth of the Bible. Remember he said, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. This is called the commandment of God. So we have these two beings, the mother and the father. In Genesis 1.27, he says, the image of God, capital I, is he made them male and female, which relates to the husband and relates to the wife or the husband and the mother. The mother becomes a mother when she bears a child. And so you have to understand what is thy mother? Not just who is thy mother, but what is a mother to be? What is thy mother? Wisdom is thy mother. Tells you that in the Apocrypha. Understanding is a mother. The book is a mother. The mother plays a multitude of roles. She's just not the cook in the kitchen. She is a teacher. She is a nurturer. She is uh, actually nourishes the little baby as, he's, as he or she is an infant. So th this is understands and, and important. Uh, what is a mother is a very profound question. Certainly this question probes beyond our earthly mother. Our natural or earthly mother is a type or a shadow of our spiritual mother. Who on earth is more content than a little baby who's just been nourished by the mother? See, the Holy Ghost, even though it's male, uh, it talks about nourishing fathers and it calls him a comforter, a word that is often used the mother, you can see uh, somebody is holding the baby and the baby is crying and screaming and all these things. And then you hand the little baby to the mother and somehow instinctively that little baby knows I'm in the presence of a comforter. And all of a sudden the baby hushes and maybe goes to sleep. There's something that God has gifted to a mother that is so unique that nobody has. It is through our physical and earthly mother that we are conceived and birthed in the flesh. Hence, we can see that through our spiritual mother, we are conceived, birthed in the spirit. So you have a physical mother, you have a spiritual mother. The evangelical church has practically ignored the role of the feminine in our conversation. Perhaps this is an overreaction to the Catholic view of Mary. The Bible chooses to put the focus on Sarah almost more than even on Mary. Sarah, as we know, is look to Sarah, the mother who bear you, because she's talking about faith. But it does so in an unusual way, and I hope to explore the feminine aspect of conversion to Christ in this book. When we enter into the spiritual world, it is much like entering into the physical world. Jesus' words ring loud and clear. Uh, John 3 through 8, we've covered this before, but uh, you can never cover too much. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily. And when you see a double word that's called in theological terms an epizuxis, which means 
This is really important. Pay attention. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we all know that before a child is born, the water breaks. And so he's born of water. For nine months, this baby is in a cocoon of water. The word water in numbers is 1611, mm. which is really important. So you're, you're conceived in birth. Everything is done around the 1611. And uh, the church is almost totally forgotten, the 1611. Uh, there are seven 1611 Bibles. There are issued uh, seven of them. Every page was interchangeable. The page size was 16 by 11. You weigh them without the covers. They weigh 16 pounds, 11 ounces. It's the seven eyes of God. It's the seven spirits of God. No other Bible has gone through this. And then this Bible... Just like Jesus died, this Bible died and went out of vogue. 222 years after it was birthed, it was rebirthed, just like we're reborn into the kingdom in 1833, where they said every word on the same place of the page as it was in 1611 and made it an image of the 1611. The primary difference one is in the Gothic print or Gothic print, the Old English, and the other is in Roman type because that represented a light to the Gentile because the whole world had been taken over by Rome. Mm -hmm. And Rome, again, is trying to take over the whole world. Mm -hmm. Much of this immigration nonsense, and we heard the figure this morning, there are as many as maybe 50 million people have have been illegally brought into this country. This plan was birthed in about 1880 or thereabouts by the Roman Catholic Church to flood America with Catholics. And about 90% of the people come in are Catholic. And there are a lot of fine people in the Catholic Church uh, that are ignorant of what the plan of the devil is, but they're, they're trying to destroy real Christianity, mm -hmm. trying to destroy uh, the 1611 Bible. You'll look on their uh, book list and on their imprimatur, the things that you can read. You, you can read any pagan Bible, but the Bible you will not find on their book accepted readings for Catholics is any of the King James family. Mm -hmm and especially the 1611, because they know that if you get into the 1611, you're getting into the fierce man of war that will begin to destroy what they're doing. They almost lost it all under Martin Luther when Martin Luther realized we have 18 different Bibles in German, in Germany, no shortage of Bibles. But when he got converted, he realized we don't have a real Bible. We have a counterfeit Bible. We have uh, the Bible of the works of men out of Egypt, out of Egypt, out of bondage. All your modern Bibles in America today are out of Egypt. They're all Catholic Bibles. So if you're using an NIV, a New American Standard, whether you believe it or know it or understanding, you are a Catholic. You're in mm. the Catholic faith. And you don't have to change it much to lose the spirit. Nadab and Abihu, they mm -hmm. took strange fire. And as a result, the fire from heaven came down and consumed them. When you're dealing with a modern Bible, you're dealing with strange fire. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of Bibles and other languages that are okay because they were birthed out of the King James family. That's a whole, there's an anointing spirit there. And you can see that the world is getting worse and worse and worse since they're following the Jezebel mother who is seducing the world, who is teaching the world. You see that in, uh, in fact, we could turn there right now just for fun, Revelation 2.20. And uh, a friend of mine uh, showed me this uh, the other day. Uh, Jacob, 
uh, he comes up with some cool stuff there. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against these, talking to the uh, angel of the church of Thyatira. Thyatira. And, and notice, uh, these things saith the Son of God. So this is Jesus himself talking as he's talking to each of the churches. He's talking to the pastor of the church or the angel of the church and uh, whose eyes are like a flame of fire and feet are like fine brass. I know that works, that charity, that service, that faith, that patience, that works. And the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou suffer that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess is, that word comes out to 1611. She's claiming to be a 1611, as wow. most uh, Bibles always compare themselves to the King James, to teach and the word preach means to, uh, the idea to reach and to teach is, is that main word each in there. And to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, if you look in the outer court there, Jezebel, which called, and you have that last letter call, the le is an L, which also could be a one. And then you have 1 Kings 16 on the outer court. So you, you can, if you read that in a Hebrew fashion, you have to learn how to read things. But there are so many hidden things here. It says 1611. And, and so she is trying to seduce people to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. If you're using a modern Bible, you're eating things sacrificed to idols. Those are spiritual idols. And they're spirit, and you're committing spiritual fornication because you walk away from his book. And I gave her a space to repent of her fornication. She repented or not. This is what the church is embracing this false prophetess. Behold, I cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, I know God is going to sort this out. I know there are people that are using the wrong Bibles that have never dug deep and, and understand what they're into. So, uh, and I, uh, God is going to sort all this out. I, I'm going to leave to him. I'm not, because I, I've known people and I've, I've been in the Catholic church. I've been to the Vatican. I've uh, been with the priests, stayed with them overnight. I've stayed in a monastery. And it's so sad. There's so many nice people that uh, have a good heart, but but they're just blind as could be because they've submitted to this false system, this beast system. So how God's going to deal with all of this, I, I'm leaving it up to him. But look at 23. This is strong language. But I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts. The reins and the hearts. And I will give to every one of you according to your works. Remember how we said uh, the word that I gave you is heart. He keeps bringing back and reminding throughout this whole Bible. I search the hearts. It's all about the heart. But unto you that say, 
unto the rest of Thyatira as many have, have not this doctrine which have not known the depths of Satan. As they speak, I will put none other burden. In this church, there were people that were into the depths of Satan. And most people don't have a clue. Satan comes as an angel of light. He presents them a modern Bible. And they think, well, this is easier to read than that old King James. And they don't understand there's an anointing of the fire that came from heaven. Now, when we talk about the King James Bible, we go to the very last chapter of, of the Bible. And he talks about our mother here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is a drawing here. This line down is a pure water river of crystal. It's very clear what this is here throughout the whole 1611 Bible. They never put anything in this river to obstruct it. And it's coming out of the throne or the head of uh, the kingdom of God, the throne of God, pouring down. And then he says, in the midst of the street of it, and of either side of the river, there was the tree of life. So what you see in the text is the tree of life. He has restored what was in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden comes out to 1611. Now this is the portable Garden of Eden that God has uh, presented to us. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. Now we've taught you how to read across the river. So let's look at scripture two. In the midst of the street of it, you cross the river. And you see the word churches, just like you saw the word book that uh, don't touch me, he said there after his resurrection. I have not yet ascended to my book. Then he says here, in the midst of the street of it, churches. Wow. And so that's what he's doing. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. Everything now in his kingdom is around the churches. And we saw there were seven churches, there's seven Bibles. This is a picture that we need to see. But I want to call your attentions to Scripture 7. Behold, I come quickly. Jesus saying, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings and the prophecy of this book. But remember what we said earlier. You can drop the factotum on this. And so it reads, he that keepeth the sayings of this book is going to get the benefits of this book. Now, notice he's wrapping up the whole Bible here. This is the last chapter, chapter 22. And he's going to repeat over and over again an emphasis on the book. And you've asked, what is thy mother? Thy mother the prime representative of thy mother is his book. Now look at what it says in eight. And I, John, saw these things, heard them. And when he had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then he said to me, see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of his book. It says this book here 
but you can read it without the factotum. I keep the sayings of his book, Worship God. So he's saying here, don't worship me, worship God. He's the only one that deserves worship. So there's a, a second time of his book. So you have to ask the question, which is his book? And then you have to ask the question, what qualifies his book? How do we know? Well, if he's got seven eyes, seven churches, seven spirits, seven uh, of this and that, there obviously is going to have to be seven books. There's only one book where there were seven issues where every book, every page was interchangeable and every page measured the same size, and every word and letter was set on the same place of the page as it was in the other edition. The first one's called the great he, second called the great she, and the other Bibles there all explain different things about events in God, the he, 1611 he, 1611 she, then we have also 1613, which means the word. I know we've said this thing before, but it's again 1614. That's the day of the month Jesus was crucified, 1617, the day of the month Jesus resurrected from the dead. If he had not resurrected, all this is in vain. 1634 means foundation. 1640 means the beginning of trials. So this pattern and then all of this died and was resurrected in 1833 which becomes the border uh for light to the gentiles so these two volumes the 1611 he and the 1633 he becomes the border of protection for the whole church world now so of this book and uh, this is his book the sayings of his book worship god and he saith to me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of his book, this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give Every man according to his works shall be. God is coming for his church and he has special rewards. When he says, uh, God so loved the world, that's totally different than God so loved the church because for the church, he has rewards for them, for everyone according to his work in the church. So everybody needs to get busy and do whatever you can that gifted that God gives you to bless his kingdom and to expand his kingdom. Mm -hmm. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first ampersand, the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. He brings you all the way back to Deuteronomy 28. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. This is powerful stuff. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolatry and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. He's describing these are the people that are going to be in hell. These are the people, I love them, I died on the cross for them, but they never brought their submission to me, therefore they cannot be part of the church and they're going to suffer for all eternity. I didn't make this up. God said this. Jesus said it. He said, man, if you have to go into heaven without an eye, so be it. If you have to cut off your hand, whatever it is, but get into heaven. Do not miss this opportunity. And all he says, you just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and thou shall be saved. You couldn't get a better statement of mercy than that. And yet most people just shrug it off like it's not that important. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things 
in the churches. I am the rod, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And if you look across the river, the leaves of the tree say, come. What are the leaves of the tree? In the, uh, uh, not the Bishop's Bible, but the, uh, the Matthew's Bible, they actually call these in the Bible, they have a dissertation. These are called the leaves of the tree. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is the tree of life. And every page is known as a leaf. And uh, the leaves of the tree are inviting everybody to come. They're like a mother. Come, feed on me. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Hear it again. The prophecy of his book. And remember, every time when you say of this book or in this book, translated into numbers, it comes out to 1611. He's making it very clear. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the 1611 Bible or in this book or in his book. God has a book. God finished the book. The last word on the page here is finished. On the cross, he said it is finished. Another place he said it is done. It is done comes out to 1611. He finished it. Okay, he finished the book, written in this book. If any man, Scripture 19, shall take away from the words of this book. Now, here he spells words here, W-O-R-D-E-S, as he did in Scripture 18. And that means the physical words that are written in this book. When he spells it W-O-R-D, that's the incorruptible sea we're born again, that you can't corrupt. But you can take and reprint this as many people have and made their own Bibles and corrupted it. And uh, I believe they're going to be in great trouble with God. For if any man should take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in his book or in this book talking about the whole Bible. He, double E, which testifies these things, saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Verse 20 there, scripture 20, has 16 words in it, and 21 has 11. There you have finishing the Bible with the 1611, and then it's stamped with Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. So all of that, this book, his book, is explaining what is thy mother. I hope that helps people understand what is thy mother. And we'll not. I, I got one page into the book, and uh, so we'll we'll carry on and deal with who is thy mother at a later date. Yeah. Any questions or comments? No, that was a, such an excellent, excellent study. I was taking notes. I've gotten good at listening and taking notes. <laughs> so. Um, that's just I so think you're beautiful. Too kind to me because you say that every time, and I know. I know, I know, but it is true. It's absolutely true because you're saying things that are new, to, new to my ears. You know, studying the Bible all these decades, and now at this end time in my life, or you know, you know, I'm in my 60s now, and I started when I was a young teenager. Um, that I, you know, there, there's things that I've read my whole life. But then when you start to put together, you know, like when you say, what is thy mother? And you say, who is thy mother? 
and how you correlated that with the vine and then Jesus saying in the New Testament, I am the true vine and how you tied all of that together. And I know this sounds really kind of uh, maybe elementary like Joan, it just maybe dawned on you now. But when you said that when he made Adam and Eve, he made them both in his image. And for some reason, it just clicked with me because most people focus only on Adam, like he made man, right? Now we know that that word man can be, you know, used for like mankind, which would include women, but most people just correlate, well, he made man and then woman came out of man. But when you said he made them, them both in his image, and then you see that go all the way through and how you're tying in even with Ephesians 5 and the church and the wife, and then she becomes a mother. I just think it was awesome. Like, really, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. So, um, anyways, I still can't see you, but I'm going to trust that people will see you. But if just in fact, I... <laughs> I, I, cause I'm going to post this no matter what, because when it comes down to it, it's the, it's the message that we are looking for, but you have a book that you wrote and do you want to say a few words about the book and is it available? Yeah, this is uh, I just reprinted this one. What is thy mother and who is thy mother? And uh, I think it'd be a very helpful book for uh, those that, want to study this a little bit more in depth. Uh, today, we talked for, I don't know, an hour or whatever, it, and we covered one page. So we obviously won't cover all the pages, but for those that, and same with this book here, uh, the Red Sea and the Red Heifer, because the two are really closely tied together. A heifer is a young mother with a baby calf. And uh, it, well, the heifer is is actually the the calf that is born here, but uh, and God wants the church to be like the red heifer, without spot, without wrinkle, and so forth. And He wants marriages to be without spot, without wrinkle. And the simple byword to get there is through submission repentance, and then total, continually submitting to God's word. That's mm. simple. And then you read the blessings. That's why I brought in uh, Deuteronomy 28. It's such a powerful, the blessings and the curses. If you want your life to be full of blessings, do it God's way. If you want to be full of curses, do it Satan's way. That, mm. It's that simple. And if you want to spend eternity with God, do it God's way. If you want to spend eternity with Satan, do it his way. But you should be appraised of what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, you can, uh, you guys, in the description box below, uh, you can contact Howard. There's a phone number uh, down there. You'll be able to call him and he can... Uh, by donation, get you a 1611 King James He Bible or a 1836. Uh, 33. Uh, 33, sorry. <laughs> 1833. Okay. I knew I was saying it wrong. So an 1833 She Bible. And I highly, highly encourage you to look into the code book too to inquire about that because you really need to have get that code book if you are not familiar with reading the 1611 and the 1833 it helps hugely and immensely so um anyways i'm sure when he if you decide to call him he'll fill you in on all those things so again i want to thank you again howard i look forward to what you have for all of us next week amen well thank you for uh putting these up and uh i hope what we're saying is a blessing to people i know it's amen. It, it it takes you time to listen, and sometimes you got to listen to them several times. And I know we get into 
uh, things almost like a seminary professor at times. He said, I, I enjoy teaching, and, and but, but sometimes teaching you have to go over it several times. But I, I'm sure it'll be a blessing, especially when you get into uh, the 1833 and the 1611 Bible. And one last thing I want everybody to know, I created a playlist for Howard called Howard Alseth 1611 King James Bible Teachings. So you can uh, access that on my YouTube channel. Just when you go onto the front page, of course, to scroll down to the bottom or just click pay playlists and then it'll come up and that way you can just go everything is in order since he first began and there has been quite a good number now of his teachings that are already available and so we just keep adding and adding until until the until right so <laughs> it's been a pleasure and so we will see you next tuesday hang out so i can see you on the other side okay all right you guys bye-bye god bless